Hello, my name is Maria Page and I'm a librarian at the Granville branch with Kent District Library. I'll be introducing tonight's program in just a moment. Uh, this presentation will be recorded and archived at kdl.org and at the library's YouTube page. So it can be viewed by anyone who doesn't catch it live and it will be shareable. In fact, uh, many of our online programs are archived and still viewable on our website and on our YouTube page. Uh, we've been doing a series of videos and presentations for adult topics um, or topics that adults would be into. Um, I recommend looking for the fall home maintenance tips presentation, which was presented by Home Repair Services. It's an amazing organization that is based here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, home canning presentation was just a couple weeks ago by Lions and Rabbits, which is a group and a fantastic art community. And um, mark your calendars for November 18th at 7 p.m. because we'll have a live trivia show in which you can win gift card prizes. Um, and that brings me to tonight's program, which is Circling Lake Michigan, 11, 1100 miles of history, arts, and culture. This is a fun virtual tour presented by Diana Stampler, who is a published author and a founder of the website Promote Michigan. Let me bring Diana in here. Hi, Diana. Good evening. Thanks Good for to having see you me. again. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Um, so I'm sure you are all ready, and so I'm going to give you the virtual stage here in just a moment. Um, just so anyone catching in um, or tuning in, if you want to type in your comments below, um, and Diana will answer those at the end. And um, yeah, do you feel ready? All right, great. So I'm going to do my best. Uh, please have a little patience. This is my first live virtual okay. program. Um, you know, most people, they say that the greatest fear is public speaking, and I think I'm much more comfortable in a live audience, but we're going to give it a shot. So I'm going to disappear right. here, try and share my screen with hopes that this thing will actually work. And uh, we want to go over to this window. I love technology, don't you? So we're going to see if we can get this to show up. Now, this ran perfectly fine in our test run. So there. And I'm going to trust and see that this is uh, sharing. So according to uh, what is on the screen, on my screen, it's showing that it is actually running. And uh, since I am also watching online on my phone, we're seeing that it is actually popping up as well. So, all right, we're in business. Uh, my name is Diana Stampler. I'm talking to you today from Walloon Lake, Michigan in Northern Michigan. And uh, we're going to take a virtual tour around Lake Michigan today. I'm gonna share some information on some of the highlights, some things you may not know about this particular area in this route. And um, as Maria mentioned, we'll open it up to comments and questions toward the end. So a little bit of my background. Um, I have a degree in print and broadcast journalism from Western Michigan University. I was born and raised in Plainwell, Michigan. And uh, after a short stint in public education, I was hired in 1997 at the West Michigan Tourist Association in Grand Rapids. And I worked with that organization for seven years. While I was there, my very first project with the organization was the development of that year's annual Lake Michigan Circle Tour and Lighthouse Guide. And that is the inspiration for this presentation. So just a little bit of uh, background, you know, people have been traveling around Lake Michigan for, um, for decades. It has been a popular tourist attraction and even as early back in the 1970s, the local media um, were talking about uh, this route and all of the fun things to do. So here's an article back when media newspapers had actual travel sections. 
and they talk about all of the wonderful things to do around Lake Michigan. Well, it would make sense then that over time there would be a general interest in developing a formal route around the lake, and that actually happened in the mid-1950s. There were directors of visitor bureaus along the lake shore in the four states who had worked at the request of then um, Governor wife Paula Blanchard, and she had worked with the Michigan Department of Commerce as well as the Michigan Department of Transportation to develop a circle tour route for Lake Superior. And then she came to Lake Michigan. And it was really interesting with Lake Michigan because it is the only one of the Great Lakes entirely within uh, the United States. And she worked together with these folks and many others around um, around the lake and a gentleman by the name of Jack Morgan who worked for the Department of Transportation and they developed the official route and, and as you can imagine getting all of these different governmental entities in four different states to work together to develop something like this was quite an undertaking. And so they worked really hard to get this established. And in 1987, they started to put up the, in, um, the designated signs around this 1100 mile route uh, through these four states. And it became quite a photo op um, for uh, folks in the governor's office in those states, as well as the Department of Transportation. And at that time, when these routes and signs were uh, being established, they had contacted West Michigan Tourist Association and asked them if they would publish um, a guidebook to that particular um, route. And so WMTA was involved early on in that specific Lake Michigan route, and it was the second of the Circle Tour routes. I believe there's one for each of the Great Lakes currently. So WMTA, given it had represented all of those lakeshore communities in Michigan, seemed to be a natural fit um, for the organization to publish the circle tour map. And uh, they came in and worked really hard to get that first issue put together. And what was really interesting was once they had it done, and they, of course, started sending out news releases and getting the local media to come in and get involved, it really took off. So we see places like the Chicago Tribune, um, the Indy Star, and then also things like the Associated Press picking up the story and really talking about how the route was going to help tourism in these four states. And it was a great trip that you could take all within the United States. And it really was pretty pretty popular. And you can see in the bottom here how even uh, the state of Wisconsin was using the circle tour in their advertising campaigns to bring in tourists. So the very first article that appeared about the circle tour route showed up in the Chicago Tribune in 1988, the first year that the magazine was published. And it was a 52 page guide. I wish I had a copy of this very first issue. Um, and I keep scouring eBay to find one. Um, but this very first publication, in this very small article that showed up in the travel section of the Chicago Tribune generated hundreds of phone calls and letters uh, to West Michigan Tourist Association uh, to request free copies. Now, of course, this is before we had internet. This is 1988. So they had, um, the, pay, the story ran on a Sunday. They had 150 callers from the Chicago area alone that Monday. Two days later, the mailman showed up with 700 letters from Wisconsin and Illinois asking for the guide. The next day, more than a thousand email, email or excuse me, a thousand letters and phone calls came in just to request a copy of that publication. And it kind of really took off from there. So they published that magazine every year. It has evolved into different things. It was a, a magazine and currently it is available as a fold out map. And we'll take a look at that toward the end of the program. So what we're going to do um, over the next half hour, 40 minutes or so is I'm going to take you in through the four states and show you some of the highlights, maybe tell you a little bit of history about some of these areas. Um, and afterward, happy to answer questions, or if you have areas that you think I should know about along the route, um, please let me know because I'm always interested in adding to this. And also there's a Facebook page for the Circle Tour and uh, there's a lot more content than I can put there. So please be, uh, be willing to share some information if you have that.
So as we start in Southwest Michigan, in Berrien County, there is a community group of eight little towns that collectively call themselves Harbor Country. And this includes Michiana, Grand Beach, New Buffalo, Union Pier, Lakeside, Harbor, and Sawyer along the shoreline, and then Three Oaks further inland. And these communities are just super quaint. They call this area the Hamptons of the Midwest. And it's an area that you just really enjoy um, some quiet lakeside um, activities. And in this area, some unique historical figures uh, have been involved. So in Grand Beach, there is a house there that was built by the world-renowned architect Frank Lloyd Wright. He actually built three homes in this community, and the population of this town is only 220 people. So this is the Ernest Vosberg summer home. It was built in 1916 and retains much of its original design. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, was from Oak Park, Illinois, but he built uh, all over the world and was considered one of the premier architects of his generation, many say well before his time, in the designs of many of the homes um, as they were built to fit into the natural landscape. Um, and there are several communities around Michigan that have homes built by Frank Lloyd Wright as well. Next up the shoreline, we come to New Buffalo. And this is the home of the nation's first highway travel information center, or what we know today as a welcome center. It opened up in 1935, and it is one of three welcome centers operating uh, in Michigan today. Now, the 210-mile US-12 itself is very historic. It was noted as an early Mastodon Trail. Um, then it was a Native American trail known as the Great Sauk Trail. Later, slaves escaping along the Underground Railroad used this route uh, as they made their way to Detroit and then into Canada. And it became a part of that. And then in um, November of 1926, it was officially designated and is now a Michigan Heritage Trail. So a great history there as well. In the inland community of Three Oaks, a cute little town, and if you've ever seen the holiday movie called Prancer, it was filmed in 1989. It star starred Sam Elliott and Gloria Leachman. It was filmed in this small town of Three Oaks, and there are several um, parts of the film where you can actually recognize people uh, or different parts of the community that's there. This is a highlight of the holiday season for us. We always enjoy um uh, getting a chance to see this and just noting that it's from Michigan. Also of note is Dreyer's B uh, Butcher Shop in town. And if you remember the TV show Dallas that was on in the 80s, Larry Hagman somehow stumbled upon this butcher shop. And inside there's an autographed photo. His Stetson hat hangs in there. There's a script from the um, show and much more right there in that little butcher shop. So if you know me at all or have ever read any of my things, you know I'm a big fan of the gangster era, the Prohibition era, the 1920s. And in Union Pier, John Dillinger was said to be frequented at the Prusa Resort here. It had a gas station, and the kids who would man the gas tanks were always told to never start digging around or looking inside those cars as he passed through town because he had those cars custom built to hold his weapons that he would transport in and out of the state of Michigan. Michigan and also probably a little bit of illegal liquor. Now, you can't really talk about Southwest Michigan and gangsters without talking about Al Capone. He also had connections to this section of Michigan, as well as many other parts of the state. Lakeside is this cute little um, Lakeside Inn. The picture on the top shows what it looked like in the early 1900s and then below what it looks like today. It is a historic inn. And Al Capone was one of the frequent guests at this. And it said that they would bring um, liquor in on the boats and then the guests at the inn would help haul it up so that they could have parties at the inn while he was there. In the community of Harvard in Harbor Country is where film critic Roger Ebert lived. And Gene Siskel actually lived in this area as well. So if you were uh, a child of the 70s and 80s, you remember the film reviews of Siskel and Ebert. And uh, Ebert lived here until he passed away in 2013. This house, which is a 1930s era, um, 4,100 square foot Tudor style home, sold for over $4 million a few years later. But you can see how beautiful the landscape is there. And that is Lake Michigan there off into the distance. Now, if you are um, into literary 
figures. The Pulitzer Prize winning author Carl Sandburg wrote his series about Abraham Lincoln while at his summer home, which was located not far from Roger Ebert's home there. My family actually has one of those collections of that series on Abraham Lincoln that he wrote to win that Pulitzer Prize. In the community of Sawyer, uh, we have the Warren Dunes State Park. It was established back in the early 1930s. It now has three miles of shoreline, six miles of hiking trails. There are 221 campsites, three mini cabins, and almost 2,000 acres of year-round recreation. And then, of course, they have the sand dunes. Tower Hill at 240 feet above Lake Michigan will give you quite a workout and guaranteed to tire out the kids if they are running up and down in that area. One of our great sand dunes locations along the Lake Michigan shoreline. As we make our way up the coast to St. Joseph, the Silver Beach Amusement Park, it used to grace the shoreline here, started back in 1891 and operated until 1971. And the Silver Beach Carousel was just a beautiful attraction in there. It had 44 hand-carved like life drawing or horses that the, the kids would ride on. And that operated until 1971 as well. In 2010, they actually built a new building and a new carousel there so that the next generation of families can come in and enjoy the Silver Beach area in South Haven. We also have some great history in Benton Harbor. The Israel, Israelite House of David was co-founded by Benjamin and Mary Purnell in March of 1903, and they actually operated a world-famous amusement park in a zoo. They had the Springs of Eden Park. They had a baseball team. They had a train that still operates in this area, and um, they drew um, visitors from all over um, the country to come into this area at what they now consider consider uh, Eden Park, Eden Springs Park. And uh, they actually had uh, ownership of an island up near Beaver Island on High Island where they did some farming over the years. Uh, this next one is kind of fun. I caught this movie on TV recently. If you've ever seen the movie The Time Traveler's Wife uh, or read the book, it was based on um, South Haven, Michigan. So the 2003 best-selling book by Audrey Neffinger uh, and the 2009 movie is set in South Haven. Now in the movie, you really don't notice so much about the South Haven connection, but in the book you do. She was born in South Haven, but moved away to Evansville, Illinois, or excuse me, Evanston, Illinois at the age of two. But she had such an impact on her family visits to the South Haven area that she felt it would be the perfect backdrop for this book. Now, uh, there was something in the news recently in the last couple of years that HBO is actually looking to make a series out of that film and book, and they were scoping things out in South Haven. So we'll see if that transpires into anything. In Douglas, if you grew up visiting this particular area back in the day, in the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s, you may have stopped by the historic root beer barrel. And it was a root beer shop and hot dog stand, and it operated until the 70s, and then it fell into disrepair. Well, they recently restored it. That, that barrel actually has 125 staves, and they've restored it all, and it is now drawing a lot of attention for folks that are heading to Oval Beach which is one of Michigan's most noted beaches. In fact, it has been rated one of the top beaches in the country by MTV. And that's been a designation that they've had for many years. In Saugatuck, just up the road and of particular interest is this town of uh, Singapore. It's considered a ghost town. And it was actually one of the casualties of the four great fires that ravaged the Midwest on October 8th of 1871. So that uh, would be tomorrow's date. Um, the Chicago fire actually took out parts of um, the Thumb of Michigan, Holland, Michigan, uh, Manistee, parts of um, Wisconsin as well. And Singapore wasn't necessarily burned, but they, they used the natural resources and the lumber in the area and that depleted the natural resources as they were rebuilding these towns. And when you pull out all of the trees, then of course there's nothing to keep the sand in place. And over time, the houses and um, the buildings that were left standing in Saugatuck in the Singapore area became covered in sand and they call it Michigan's Pompeii. 
And uh, there's a historical marker in town, but the town had uh, two hotels, three mills, general store, Michigan's first schoolhouse. And if you take the dune rides through the Sagatuck area, you can often, um, it, depending on the, the wind and the sands, see some of the remnants of that area. In Holland, if you did not know, author L. Frank Baum, who created the Wizard of Oz series, spent every summer between 1898 and 1910 at his house there that he called the Sign of the Goose. And it is said that Castle Park and this castle that stands there still today was his inspiration for the Wizard of Oz. You know, as we grew up watching this um, this film and watching it now with children and grandchildren, it's interesting to note that it it may not have ever happened if he had not spent his summers in Makatawa there in the Holland area. There are several books in the series, um, but they even say that there was a young girl uh, in town named Dorothy, and he used her as the inspiration for his lead character in that film. Now, just last uh, summer, the community of Holland fully embraced its Oz connections with the establishment of the Oz Park Project. And I have yet to see this in person, but I am so excited. They've created this, um, this book out of flowers and plants. It is located in Centennial Park. Of course, that is the yellow brick road that will take you there. And then outside of the Herrick District Library, they have a series of sculptures of some of the uh, major characters from that, uh, from that classic film. So if you get a chance to get over there and check that out. In Grand Haven, of course, we have the world's largest musical fountain. It is a synchronized display of water and lights located on Dewey Hill on the north shore of the Grand River. That's not far from the uh, mouth of the uh, Grand River there. It was designed by local engineer William Morris Booth II, built in 1962 for $250,000 and built primarily by local volunteers. And it is quite a show, a great attraction during the summer in what was known as Michigan's very first Coast Guard City, USA. Another historical figure has ties to the Muskegon area, and we in fact just celebrated his birthday, uh, I believe it was October 4th, and that is Buster Keaton. The Muskegon Actors Colony was part of a neighborhood in the Muskegon area known as Bluffton. And back in the um, the early 1900s, folks from the uh, vaudeville scene and the silent film scenes, they primarily uh, came from places like St. Louis where it got really hot in the summer. So they would make their way up along the Lake Michigan shoreline to spend their summers with their families. And a lot of these folks ended up in the Muskegon area. And Buster came as a child with his family, uh, but he went on to become one of the most noted silent film stars. He was known as the Great Stone Face. And and uh, his work is well-renowned. His fan club still um, is in the South Haven area, or excuse me, in the uh, Muskegon area. And they come in every October um, and they have their um, annual conference and they show a bunch of his films and really celebrate his ties to Lake Michigan. In Whitehall, we have one of Michigan's 125 lighthouses. There are about 130 lights on Lake Michigan as well. And it's interesting to note that when I first started at West Michigan Tourist Association, um, it was this project that really introduced me to the lighthouses of Michigan. And, um, you know, growing up in Michigan, I lived in Plainwell, which was about 45 minutes from the lakeshore. And I'm sure I saw lighthouses when I was growing up, but it really didn't resonate with me, the significance of them until I started working at WMTA and cataloging all of them on Lake Michigan uh, at that time. Now I've just become fascinated with them in general. So this is the lighthouse, the White River Light Station in Whitehall. It was built in 1875. Thanks to that gentleman in the left-hand corner, that is Bill Robinson. And Bill and his wife, Sarah, uh, came to the area from England in the 1860s. He was instrumental in having the light built. He worked there as the first keeper and was there for more than 40 years before he died there in 1919. And it is said that his ghost and Sarah's is still on at the lighthouse. Now, the woman next to him 
is actually Frances Marshall. She was one of the uh, of about 50 female lighthouse keepers in Michigan, and she served as a civilian keeper from 1949 to 1954. Now, of her claim to fame was during her time there, she was actually brought in to appear on a game show um, and she was on the show, What's My Line? And she actually stumped the panel and was able to win a prize of what she told me was $50 uh, for being on there. And I recently found the YouTube video of that. And it was pretty neat to see her participation uh, in that show. Now, while I'm here, I'm going to do a selfless plug. As Maria mentioned, I am a published author. My book, Michigan's Haunted Lighthouses, was uh, released last March from the History Press. And it includes 13 different lighthouses in Michigan that are rumored to be haunted. Now, our oldest light in Michigan is Fort Gratiot, which is over in Port Huron, dating back to 1825. Of Michigan's 125 or so lights, about 40 of them are rumored to be haunted. 13 of them are featured in the book. And uh, you can get a copy of that available online at mihauntedlighthouses.com for those who are interested. Uh, in the community of Montague, we have one of my absolute favorite places in the entire state of Michigan. It is the Dog and Suds. And I have been going to this place since the late 90s. It is owned by the Hostica family. David Hostica owns this and one in Muskegon. And the first Dog and Suds actually opened in the 1950s in Illinois. This one is just a classic. It is um, right on the main road in downtown Montague next to the river. And if you are passing through this area, you definitely need to stop in and uh, get a mug of frosty root beer, a hot dog, a burger, I don't care, get whatever you want, but it is one of the great nostalgic places to celebrate um, cuisine here in West Michigan. In Silver Lake, we talked about the dunes earlier down in uh, Berrien County at the Sawyer area, but the Silver Lake sand dunes are the only place in Michigan uh, where you can drive your own vehicle out on the dunes. There are actually three different areas uh, of the dunes here at the Silver Lake St Sand Dune State Park. But Mackwood's Dune Rides has been offering their dune buggy rides since the 1930s. Back then, it only cost 25 cents, so it's a little bit more than that today. Um, but you can get a chance to go out and uh, take a ride on the dunes. Now, that picture on the bottom, if, if you're not familiar with that, that's a fulgurite. And that's basically what happens when, uh, when lightning strikes sand. It kind of fuses the sand molecules together and creates kind of this little piece of coral. If you've ever seen the movie... Um, Sweet Home Alabama, you know how when the lightning hits the sand, they dig out that beautiful glass sculpture. Well, it's kind of like that, but not nearly as glamorous. In Hart and Shelby, Michigan, it is the asparagus capital of America. Michigan ranks third in the nation for asparagus. We produce 25 million pounds off of 11,000 acres, and 25% of that is sold locally. But most of it is grown in Michigan in this area in Oceana County. And uh, it is part of our Michigan's $104 billion a year agricultural industry. In Ludington, you find one of our other great attractions, the Lake Michigan Car Ferry, the SS Badger. It offers the largest cross-lake passenger service on the Great Lakes, and it goes from Ludington, Michigan to Manitowoc, Wisconsin. And of course, we'll catch Manitowoc on the other side of the lake. It's a, uh, a one-hour, 60-mile cruise that takes you there. They can load up RVs, buses, cars motorcycles, you name it. Uh, I've been on it many times. There's a gift shop, there's a theater, there's a game room. You can even get uh, bunk rooms if you wanted to, to rest during your transportation across the lake. In Manistee, the historic Ramsdale Theater was constructed in 1903, home of the Manistee Civic Players. But there's one key person who got his start there, and that is James Earl Jones. You might know him as the voice of CNN. You might know him as Mufasa from The Lion King or Darth Vader from Star Wars. But after James Earl Jones was uh, raised in the area, he graduated in 1949 from Brethren High School, and he got his start at the Ramsdale Theater playing in Othello. 
in Frankfurt is another great attraction. I remember finding this uh, quite early on uh, in my days at WMTA, and I actually own several Gwen Frostick original prints. She was an artist, an author. She's in the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame, and her wonderful nature-based studio and gallery is built here into the wall of the of the yard there, the hillside in Frankfurt. And she uses block prints that are made and she has everything just nature based. So she was this little, um, this little raccoon is one of her noted characters. Um, she wrote poetry. She has napkins and note cards and all kinds of wonderful things. Um, as part of her collection. Uh, as I mentioned, she was inducted to the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame. She went to Western Michigan University. And when she passed away, she donated uh, all of her money to Western and they now named the art department after her there in Kalamazoo. In Beulah, this is one of the places that I discovered uh, the summer between high school and college. My dad and I went on a road trip of Michigan before I went off to Western. And on our way back, we stopped at the Cherry Hut in Beulah. It is an uh, institution. Uh, it's been around since 1922, and uh, they serve everything you could ever imagine that is filled with cherries. And that makes sense because the bulk of the cherries grown in Michigan are grown in this area of northern Michigan, Benzie County, Leelanau, Grand Traverse County. So you'll see obviously a lot of things that have cherries in the name in this area like the Cherry Bowl Drive-In in, in honor. They opened up in 1953 in the cherry capital of the world, one of about 13 drive-ins operating still uh, here in the state of Michigan. Uh, very fortunate. I didn't go to drive-ins when I was a kid, but I did have the chance as my children were growing up to take them not only to the Cherry Bowl, but also to the Capri Drive-In down in Coldwater. A few years ago, Good Morning America named the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore the most beautiful place in America, and it was based on response of uh, viewers. And so that tells you how many people in Michigan voted in and absolutely love this area. Uh, this is a 71,000 acre park, uh, the Sleeping Bear Dunes, and it has so many beautiful attractions as part of that. Uh, you've got, of course, the historic fish town. You've got the Pier Stocking Drive and the Covered Bridge. You've got the Glen Haven Historical Village. You've got the Dune Climb. You've got the DH Day Barns and just all of the wonderful uh, attractions. And nearly 1.5 million people visit this area of Michigan every year. It's considered one of our top tourist attractions. Now, as we travel through this area, you actually pick up one of Michigan's most noted roads, which is M22. And this actually starts down in, um, in Manistee County, travels up through Benzie County, Leelanau, skirts the uh, both coasts of Leelanau County and then ends down in Traverse City. It's touted as Michigan's Route 66, one of the state's designated scenic heritage routes. It's 116 miles long. And the road was established as a designated trunk line in 1919. So this area, of course, used to be uh, primarily all cherry farms, but now you're starting to see some diversity in the agriculture. The Leelanau County itself has about 30 wineries. We also have a lot of breweries and hot yards showing up through this area as well. Now, it's kind of hard to pick out just one thing in Traverse City to talk about, so I picked two of my favorites here. One is the schooner, the Manitou, the tall ship Manitou. For over 25 years, it's been sailing out there on Grand Traverse Bay. They do Moomer's ice cream excursions. They do wine events. They do music events. And in the fall, they do multi-day wind jammers where you spend the night. There's actually bunks below deck and uh, they have 12 cabins that sleep two people and they do all kinds of themes uh, for those excursions. I was supposed to do one this fall with the Haunted Lighthouses. In fact, would have just come off the boat uh, this weekend, um, but it was uh, postponed until next year. So stay tuned if you're interested in joining in on that. And then the Northern Michigan Asylum Complex in Traverse is now the village at Grand Traverse Commons. It's one of the largest reclamation projects of its kind in the country. This is the old asylum and they were going to actually bulldoze it down and who knows, maybe turn it into a shopping complex or something. But Ray Minor Vini stepped in and he's preserved it. And he, since the 1990s, has been going in and working diligently to restore those different buildings. That main building there is building 50. It's a quarter mile long. 
And it is home to condos and restaurants and um, art galleries and bookstores and all kinds of other wonderful attractions. You could take tours of it uh, through the area. And it's just absolutely beautiful no matter what time of year you visit. A quick trip up the old Mission Peninsula takes us to Mission Table Restaurant, formerly the Bowers Harbor Inn. And it was built in the 1880s as a summer home for Chicago lumber baron J.W. Stinkney and his wife Genevieve. And uh, it has a little bit of history. And since we're heading in toward Halloween, I threw this one in here because it is rumored to be haunted. You see, J.W., he actually had an affair with his wife's nurse and it threw her into a state of um, depression. And she actually hung herself in the um, elevator shaft. And it is said that her ghost remains on inside there. This is also home to Jolly Pumpkin Brewery at that location as well. As we're back out heading north along US 31, we come to the little community of Kuwaitan. And if you jump off of the main road onto Karen Highway, you find the Hugh J. Gray Karen, which was officially ded dedicated in June of 1938. And it was for his work in creating the West Michigan Tourist Association. He was known as the Dean of Michigan's Tourist Activity, kind of the grandfather of all of the activity. Now, West Michigan Tourist Association has actually been around since 1917, and they're regarded as one of the longest operating regional tourist associations in the country, and a lot of that has to do with Hugh Gray. It's located uh, just north of Kuwaitan. The, the Karen here is actually 12 feet square at the base, 16 feet tall, and it has 83 different stones. And each stone has a county name. And they brought these in by railroad, and then they constructed this um, out there as a testament to the tourism, not only in this particular part of Michigan, but with those stones covering it all over the state as well. This is another great activity. Drove through this area just recently in Charlevoix. These are the Earl Young homes. And noted architect Earl Young created these neighborhoods. They're known as elf cottages or gnome homes or hobbit houses. And they're meant to build, blend into the natural surroundings. And so between 1918 into the 1950s, he built 30 homes in this area, most of them in the same neighborhood. Um, and you can drive uh, yourself through there. There are also now guided tours. You can walk through the area. This is the most recognizable house that he built, which is called the Thatch House. And that is a thatch roof. And they have to bring in folks from outside the country um, to help uh, keep that maintained. The photo on the bottom left shows... Um, Earl Young inside one of the houses with the fireplace. And he would go out and he would find rocks that were either in the ground or out in Lake Michigan. And he would hook them up to teams of horses and pull them out. And then he would hide them because as soon as he saw one, he would know what project he wanted to put that into. And so he would hide it and save it until he needed that particular stone for one of the projects. And if you're interested in more, there's a great book on mushroom houses that share the stories of all of these and the beautiful photographs, interior and exterior of the homes that he built through that area. He also built a couple local businesses uh, in town as well. If you take the ferry boat out of Charlevoix, you can head on over to Beaver Island. And while you're there, you can do all kinds of great outdoor recreational things. There's a new glamping place out there called Beaver Island Retreat, where you can stay in these cool safari tents. But you're going to learn a lot about Michigan's King James Strang. And he was a religious leader, a politician, a monarch. He called himself king. And he was out there and he um, was basically in charge of the Mormon population out on the island. He had, uh, I think, four or five wives, um, but he thought, thought that he was going to establish a community to rival Brigham Young in Utah until he was assassinated in 1856. He was shot. He escaped, ended up dying in Wisconsin, where he is buried. Now, in Petoskey and in the area where I'm at right now in Walloon Lake um, is noted for one key author, and that is Ernest Hemingway. Uh, he was born on July 21st, 1889, just outside of Chicago in Oak Park, Illinois, not far from where um, Frank Lloyd Wright was uh, born. And he spent the first 22 summers of his life at his family's cottage called Windermere here on Walloon Lake in northern Michigan. So that picture up on the upper left is he 
him uh, in October. So he was uh, just a few months old with his mother, Grace Hall Hemingway. Um, and uh, he came up here and this is where he learned to hunt, to fish, to live off the land. And this, we many uh, believe, is where he really found his passion that led him to be a writer and to um, be a traveler and an outdoorsman all over the world. And many of the stories in the Nick Adams stories are believed to reflect some of his early life in this area. And um, you can read that and pick up certain parts of of those stories and, and know what he's talking about here. Now, the Michigan Hemingway Society is based in Petoskey as well, and they have a self-guided walking tour that you can visit through the area, which includes uh, key sites in Petoskey, in Horton Bay, in Walloon Lake, and in other communities. And they're adding more information um, to places like Boyne City and the Pigeon River River area where he had connections to that as well. So the Hemingway Society typically would have their annual conference um, in October. They will have one again next year. And next year is also the 100th anniversary of Hemingway's first marriage in Horton Bay. And the community of Walden Lake will be doing some celebrations on that front as well. Now, just north of Petoskey is this little community known as Bayview, the Bayview Association of the United Methodist Church. And it was established in September of 1875, and it is a beautiful little historic community. By 1877, they had streets, park, public areas, and these simple cottages, what they call these, they call these cottages. And they were built, and now there are, over, uh, there are several hundred of them up there, as well as public buildings. They host all kinds kinds of music and religious programs, arts, performing arts, sports. They have sailing camps. And many of the homes here have been passed on from generation to generation. Now, the Methodist Church actually owns the land, but the families own the cottages. And with that, there come some restrictions. And so they are actually closing up all of those houses and they have to vacate them by the end of the month. And they are not allowed to return to the homes to live in them until May of next year. As you head further up, you come to another noted road in Michigan, the famed M119 Tunnel of Trees. If you have never driven this, this is the time to do it. The trees are so beautiful, colorful, and they cover the, the road um, so closely that it feels like you're driving in a tunnel. And the road is very narrow in some areas. Um, so the speed limit is about 25 miles an hour through a big chunk of this. But it will take you to beautiful areas like the Goodhart General Store and Cross Village and the famed Legs Inn Restaurant, um, which is noted for its Polish cuisine. You see the railing on the top of that uh, building. Those are actually stove legs. And that's how it got its name of Legs Inn. So um, as we make our way further north, in Mackinac City, just two miles west of downtown, is one of Michigan's best kept secrets. It is the Headlands International Dark Sky Park. It was established in 2011. It was Michigan's first dark sky park. We have another one now in Cass County. It was the sixth in the nation, and I think that one of the about the tenth in the in the world to be established. And for a dark sky park. It means that there's no light pollution in this area, that it is um, so dark that you can just really see all of the trees or all of the stars and just have a, a beautiful um, experience through there. Mackinac City is also home to Colonial Michelin Mackinac, and this is where we have the longest archaeological dig in the United States uh, going on, and that has been going on since 1959. And over the years, they have actually found uh, more than a million artifacts um, during these excavations, dating back, uh, many of them to the 1700s, from this early fort at Colonial Michilimackinac. Now, technically, Mackinac Island is in Lake Huron, not Lake Michigan, but it is the Straits of Mackinac. So I threw it in here really quick to talk about the Grand Hotel, where in 1940s, this time for Keeps was filmed. It was a movie with Esther Williams. Of course, we also have Somewhere in Time, which was filmed in the 1980s. Uh, this is also the world's largest front porch. Mackinac Island also has some of the oldest lilacs on uh, in Michigan there and the most varieties. 
They have over 800 horses on the island during the summer. And of course, if you've been to the island, you know about fudge and the fudge shops. The earliest one dates back to 1887. And in the peak summer, they say that 10,000 pounds of fudge leave the island each and every day thanks to the tourists who go through this area. That's a lot of fudge, let me tell you. The Mackinac Bridge opened up on November 1st, 1957, the third longest suspension bridge in the world, the longest between anchorages in the Western Hemisphere. It's five miles long. Now, of particular note, the first car to cross that was a 1951 Chevy, and that is on display inside the Public Museum of Grand Rapids. So you get a little connection back downstate as well if you get a chance to pop in there. As we make our way across that mighty Mac, we have now entered into the upper peninsula of Michigan and the Castle Rock, which first opened in 1928. It was an ancient lookout for the Native Americans. And now you can pay to climb up nearly 200 steps and face out there. So as you can see here, it is nice to see Paul Bunyan is masked up and protecting visitors that come to Castle Rock. It's actually one of seven Paul Bunyan sculptures and uh, displays in the state of Michigan. So it's, uh, it's kind of a big legend here through our area. As we head along US 2 heading west through the Upper Peninsula, we come to Nobbin Way and the Upper Peninsula's Top of the Lake Snowmobile Museum. It's been open since 2007, rated one of the best museums of its kind in the country. Made my first visit there over Labor Day weekend and was amazed to see how many um, snowmobiles are actually made or were made here in the state of Michigan. So that's kind of a neat thing. Uh, in the town of Manistique, as we're making our way east, we have the town's most prominent landmark, a 200 foot high neoclassical brick water tower. And uh, it is considered one of the historic sites in this community. One of my favorite attractions in the Upper Peninsula is the Fayette Historic Town Site, and it is now part of Fayette State Park. It represents one of a bustling industrial communities that operated from 1864 to 1891 by the Jackson Iron Ore Company. And they actually had 20,000 acres of hardwood forest. They made pig iron. It's been a state park since 1959. And it's actually a, kind of like a ghost town, but it's been preserved and they're working to restore many of the buildings there. And as you walk through it, you can almost feel um, like what it would have been like to be down there when it was actually operating up as a, an actual um, operating town. In Escanaba, we have the House of Ludington, which is a historic hotel. I just learned, actually, that it's going to be turned into senior living facilities. But it opened up in 1865 uh, 65 as a hotel. And over the years, it's had a couple of different names and renovations. And an article in 2015 newspaper said that there were tunnels underneath it in a prohibition era. Booze had been hidden. There were always rumors of ties to Al Capone, although local historians actually deny this repeatedly. Um, but this is Pat Hayes, and he had ties to um, Prohibition era Chicago, and he was one of the owners of that hotel for many years. So I think that there's probably a little bit more to that story than they're letting on. In Menominee, we have another Karen marking the halfway point between the North Pole and the equator. It's slightly north of the 45th parallel. And this is one of six sites in Michigan and 29 places in the United States where markers such as this exist. And with that, we're going to make our way into Wisconsin. And things always pick up a little bit when we get over this way because now we're headed south. And I like to think that gravity takes a little bit of an effect as we uh, make our way through this final stretch of the Lake Michigan Circle Tour route. Um, so... Um, as we get in here, one of the noted things is the community of Green Bay. And Green Bay um, has a great history with a, a Bay Beach amusement park with uh, the Midway and the roller coaster. Um, it was established back in 1892. Just a little tidbit there. If the only thing you ever knew about Green Bay was the Packers and the Cheeseheads. It's also the toilet paper toilet paper capital of the world. So I don't know how much they were producing for us this summer or if they've uh, expanded their operations there.
Um, next, we have uh, Door County, Wisconsin. And Door County is uh, kind of very much like Leelanau County in Michigan. They have a beautiful coastline. They actually have more lighthouses, more state parks, and more miles of shoreline. There's 250 um, plus miles of shoreline more than any other county in the United States in this area. They have over 10 lighthouses, two of which are museums. They do fish boils. They have wineries out in this area, great little bed and breakfast and little towns. So if you love uh, the Leelanau County area, then you will definitely love Door County if you have not been over there. In Sister Bay, Wisconsin, one of the most unique attractions. I wish we had something like this in Michigan. It is Al Johnson's authentic Swedish family-owned restaurant. And they have their roofs of their restaurant is grass. And you wonder, well, how do they mow it? Well, the goats take care of that. They have goats on the roof. And they've been in operation for more than 60 years. And of course, as you can imagine, when you head into dinner, that is quite an attraction for folks who want to see uh, the goats up on the roof. A lot of photo ops there for them as well. And then we get to Washington Island, which is seven miles in the Door County Peninsula. It is about five miles wide, six miles long, a population of 660 people. You take a ferry boat out there. You can take your car if you'd like. And uh, this beautiful little information teacup has been there uh, welcoming folks since 1941. So uh, many of the islands in Door County are accessible, such as Rock Island. This is a 974-acre state park, also available through Passenger Ferry out of Wisconsin. And uh, they have, it's also home to the Potawatomi Lighthouse. So Wisconsin has a fair number of lighthouses in this area as well. Uh, down the coastline, we come to Two Rivers, Wisconsin. This is a sweet place to visit because it is the home of the ice cream sundae, the birthplace of the ice cream sundae. In 1881, uh, a soda fountain there, uh, one guest asked the guys to running it to put some chocolate sauce on top of his simple scoop of ice cream. And it was only sold on Sundays originally. But one day, a little girl was in there visiting and she, it wasn't Sunday, but she asked, could I please have one? And uh, they served it up. And if you would, had never heard, it was, the su ice cream Sunday is spelled differently because a, somebody had written a check for ice cream and they misspelled it and it just kind of stuck. So they ended up keeping it spelled S-U-N-D-A-E and you can get ice cream every day of the week in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. Uh, Manitowoc, the port home for Wisconsin for the SS Badger, the Lake Michigan Car Ferry. It is Wisconsin's maritime capital. You can tour the Wisconsin Maritime Museum, the World War II submarine, the USS Cobia. And they actually built 28 submarines in this community um, during uh, World War II. And they are very proud of their maritime heritage. It's a beautiful museum if you get a chance to go down and check that out. Now, I'm sorry if you haven't had dinner today and I keep talking about food and beverage and I haven't either. So this next one's going to really make me hungry as we head to Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Sheboygan spelled with an S as opposed to Sheboygan, Michigan, which is spelled with a C. Sheboygan, Wisconsin is the bratwurst capital of the world. And in 1945 is when Johnsonville Brats were founded there in a family company with a family recipe, and they still have their corporate headquarters there. They've been hosting a, a bratwurst festival in this community since the 1950s. In Port Washington, Wisconsin, in addition to having a historic lighthouse, the town boasts the largest collection of pre-Civil War buildings in the, in the state of Wisconsin, and they have a pioneer village with several restored buildings there. Uh, I love visiting um, historical villages and just learning about the, the history of every, any given area, so definitely add Port Washington to your list. Things are a little goofy in Milwaukee. I mean, Milwaukee, you could talk about a lot of great things. Of course, you've got beer and baseball, but you've also got clowns. Each year, this town turns into a circus with all kinds of parades, horse-drawn processionals. They have over 100 units, three-mile route. It's held in July, boasts more than 50 historic circus wagons, 700 horses, 1,000 musicians, 
2,000 costumed participants, 100 clowns, and just so much more. Now, if you head a little bit inland, you get to Baraboo, which is the um, the clown capital, I guess, of, of America with the clown museum. So there's a lot of clowning around apparently going on in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, in Racine, it is the Kringle capital of the world. And I don't mean Kris Kringle as in Santa Claus. Kringles are a delicate pastry, a Danish pastry, and they make them there. They've been doing that for um, since, the uh, since the 1880s. And, um, you know, I have, a, I have a love to bake, but this looks like it's a little time consuming. They actually fold the dough back and forth over 140 times to get each of the thin, crispy, wafery-like layers of these Kringles. But they've mastered it over the years and the last 100 plus years. And uh, you can get them at stores all over Wisconsin. And I've actually seen them in certain places in Michigan as well. So we think that Michigan is the auto capital. And well, clearly we are the auto capital of Detroit, Flint, Saginaw. Uh, we've got the Gilmore Car Museum in Hickory Corners, which is noted for its uh, great auto heritage. But Kenosha, Wisconsin actually produced millions of vehicles between 1902 and 1988 under various brands. The Rambler, Nash, Hudson, Lafayette, Jeffrey, Winther, American Motor Company. They just uh, were a large producer in that. That, um, in that state for automobiles. So it's more of a, of a Midwest or a Great Lakes region thing when it comes to the automobile industry. And with that, we're heading into Illinois. One quick stop or two here in, in this city or excuse me, in this state. And we're going to start in Evanston, Illinois. And this is the home of Northwestern University. And it is also um, where the Gross Point Lighthouse is located. And that lighthouse also rumored to be haunted. Um, and if you keep making your way south, you know, I could do a whole presentation just on Chicago itself. But you may not know this one. This was kind of an interesting one. The Ferris wheel also known as the Chicago Wheel, was designed and built by George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. as a centerpiece for the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. It was the tallest attraction, 264 feet. It was then dismantled and rebuilt in Lincoln Park uh, in Chicago in 1895, and then dismantled and rebuilt a third and final time for the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis before it was finally demolished in 1906. Now, I'm not sure if I'd want to keep getting on it if it was taken down and put back together that many times, but maybe they're pretty skilled at what they're doing with that uh, Ferris wheel there. And then our fourth and final state of the evening as we end our trip in the uh, state of Indiana, Northwest Indiana. This was a new slide. I just learned this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Back in the 1920s, this is Zerna Addis Sharp. She was a school teacher from Indiana. And she was walking along the shores of the Lake Michigan shoreline uh, in the Indiana area. And she observed some children playing on the beach. And that inspired her to create a series of books for young readers. I remember starting my reading career with Fun with Dick and Jane. And she actually was instrumental in this uh, series being published between the 1930s and the 1960s. So without that, we wouldn't have had uh, some of our earliest um, reading, uh, I remember, from Gilkey Elementary uh, in Plainwell. So that was kind of a neat little tie-in to find uh, for Indiana along the Lake Michigan Circle Tour. Now, since 1988, the West Michigan Tourist Association has published its versions of the Lake Michigan Circle Tour and Lighthouse Guide and Map. Those two on the far left are the full magazines that the Ladies of the Light Color uh, Sunset one was one of my favorites to actually work on and to write the stories about um, the Circle Tour. The 2020 edition of the Lake Michigan Circle Tour Map is available online and the Kent District Libraries has received a shipment of those. And uh, Maria will share with us after we're done about how you can get a copy of that from the library directly, or you can um, get one through the West Michigan Tourist Association website at WMTA.org. 
on their website. They also have um, itinerary planning, and then they have turn by turn directions if you need that information. If you're if you're going to go map an old school without the GPS, you can get details on that. That is the um, I believe that's the Frankfurt light on the cover of this year's uh, map. Always exciting to see that issue uh, when it comes out. So it is available for free. And uh, you, as I said, you can get a copy from the library or from WMTA's website at WMTA.org. If you are interested in more information about Circling Lake Michigan. You have some unique little tidbits to share with me about places that I might want to know about. You can log on to Facebook and look up Lake Michigan Circle Tour. Send me a message and tell me about those great places because I'm always changing things up on this program and adding new information. And uh, I'm always looking for new things to share. So please feel free to, um, to share with me. And uh, we'll uh, look forward to updating that program uh, and catching you on it on the next time around. I gotta unmute myself. Thank you so much, Diana. That was so much fun. Um, I feel like I really did travel um, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we uh, broke any speed limits, but maybe we did. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it must be hard to find just like a couple tidbits um, for each town um, and to talk about it. I mean, there's just so much to say. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to narrow it down. And uh, sometimes new things pop up. And I mean, some of them seem like kind of obvious things. Um, and I try to go through and, and pick things that maybe people don't know about a particular area. Um, but sometimes yeah. I don't know. I mean, this thing about Dick and Jane was great. A, a radio friend posted about that. So I'm excited to see if any of the folks that um, are listening tonight have things that I should check out myself. Um, or um, share with me about different places so that I can add it to the Facebook. Yeah, and if um, anyone does have those ideas, just comment below. Um, you do have quite a few just compliments on um, the show. Uh, Melissa, is just thank you. Um, just thought it was very fascinating. Um, Brian says um, that he tuned in from Illinois, so that was awesome. Oh, nice. And, um, Oh, Shelly. Shelly. Hi, Shelly. I've been, watching, I've been watching on Facebook, too, so I have a couple friends that are out there. So, Shelly, if you can do the whole 1,100 miles on your bike, you're a better woman than I am, and we already know that that is the case. So go for it. I believe she could do that, too. I do. Uh, I honestly, she could. Probably like three days. Um, and just um, just in case you are local and um, would like me to um, drop one of these at your local library branch, this is the Lighthouse Map and Circle Tour uh, guide that you were mentioning, Diana. So yeah, it's, um, I mean, just, it's a, it's a it's full blown. A, yeah, it's amazingly huge. And oh, it's upside um, down, but yeah, it's it's quite a map. Right. Yeah. Um, definitely worth a look for sure. Um, I enjoyed looking at it. So it really puts it in perspective, the full circle. Um, yeah. So email me, uh, Maria Page at mpage at kdl.org. Um, if you'd like me to just send one to your local branch. So. And with that, I think um, that is it. No questions for this evening. I'm sure you'll monitor that um, later. But uh, yeah, really appreciate you doing this presentation. It was it was a lot of fun. Great, thanks. And I will keep an eye on Facebook. And if anybody has questions or whatnot, I'll answer them there. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.